Extraordinary powers are part and parcel of many games, be it the strengthened fingers of every assassin from here to Havana, or the literal magic powers on hire purchase from the ultimate soft boy himself, there are tried and tested means to delivering an experience. And, since we haven't yet hardwired our bodies into the computers, these abilities are all called forth by some series of button presses, quite often bearing no relation to the actions our avatar carries out on screen. Clicking a mouse is not quite the same as shooting a gun. Punching in an intricate button combo results in some spectacular loops and whirls, but since our fingers aren't bodies and the controllers aren't Dance Dance Revolution pads, they're not really equivalent actions. Which, don't get me wrong, is quite a relief. I'm not sure my thighs could cope with most of those advanced techniques. What I'm getting at is that the avatars we control in these simulations are just that. Avatars. We play the part of puppeteer or commander, and our loyal pets dutifully play to the fiddle of our flute. Wait, fiddle of our flute is not a phrase. Second fiddle? Uh. Wait, I got it. Dum de dum de dum. We play the part of puppeteer or commander, and our loyal pets dance to our tune. Nailed it. Basically, we tell them to jump off the cliff, but we're not the ones actually jumping. A simple point, but one that needs to be explicitly stated here, I think. So where am I heading with this? As anyone who's watched the channel for a bit can probably tell, I'm a bit of a sucker for the old walk-in simulators. I love how they strip back that element of control and ability that we're normally given, and explore what they can achieve without all the shooty-bang flip-flip. This isn't to say that other genres can't have something interesting to say, and many of them do, but that these games with minimal or limited control can have this hyper-focus on what it is that they're doing, for better or for worse. One that uses it for something novel is What Remains of Edith Finch, and it's at this point that I will sound the alarms. Sorry, uh, wrong button. And... There we go. Yes, I will be exploring what remains of Edith Finch, Lewis's section in particular, and if you want absolutely nothing ruined, then go on, pause the video, go play it. I'll wait. All done? Great, let's on with the show. The main conceit of what remains of Edith Finch... Oh gosh, we need to acronymize that one stat. The main conceit of REF is that you play through these little death vignettes of the Finch family, slowly working your way up the family tree from its base, moving towards the modern day and uncovering the stories hidden in the old family pile. Lewis is central character Edith's brother, and as such, his story comes near the end of the game. Personally, it's one of the most affecting stories which I've experienced in the vid games, both because of the story itself and, importantly, the way in which it's told. But first, some delicious background. Lewis graduated from high school and went into the exciting and promising career of cannery work. Back at home, he hung about in his room, reading, playing games, and getting high. Well, when he wasn't buying wicked cool posters, that is. Anyway, after being convinced by his mother and his psychiatrist to seek treatment for his substance abuse, the monotony of his nine to five slicing fish heads was driven home. The magic here is that we are placed in his situation. We instantly empathize and join in the experience. Everyone's had that one job that is mundanity redefined, shuffling things from one place to another with no real sense of accomplishment or meaning. So when Lewis starts to daydream, it's natural. The small imagination cloud which bursts into being is earned. It's what our brains were about to conjure up anyway. Having been forced to emulate the task of sliding fish to a guillotine before sloshing it into the gutter, we are literally in Lewis's shoes and the daydream is a welcome release. From now on, as players, we have to balance work with our imagination, one of our hands controlling the daydream and one controlling reality. This direct mapping of control to what's happening on screen even more firmly places us into that scene. We find ourselves pushing reality into our subconscious, a necessary routine which only needs to be concentrated on occasionally. Lewis's imagination moves from the 2D to the isometric, from the isometric to full 3D. As the piece plays out, the dream eventually takes over the entire screen. The fish are the only handle we have left on reality. We continue to slice and slosh, but the guillotine and gutter are invisible. Forgotten. 
our attention is focused on Lewis's dreamt up world, and eventually we burst through from this fantastical world of musing and colour to a locker room. A muted and suffocating locker room. The job is gone. The dream is gone. Reality is smashed back into our faces and we walk through to the cathedral-like cannery. Mountains of fish travel along conveyors, ferried to the stream where they seemingly swim away. We walk the aisle towards a lone, illuminated figure. This man is broken. Head down, he moves his hands in that familiar motion, grab fish, slice fish, throw fish, yet no fish graces his hands. This is Lewis. We hold him in contempt. His placidity keeps him there, head down to the task at hand, not even noticing that the fish have stopped coming. He is a prisoner of reality. We leave this sad automaton to his fate before mounting the conveyor which carries us onwards, upwards. We travel towards the light. The window opens in front of us, and the conveyor takes us slowly away from reality, back into the dream. Our disgust that the Lewis out there is celebrated. We are choosing the right path. After all, this palace is a scene of music, dancing and life. We are plonked down and slowly mount the steps, the narration telling us there's only one thing left to do. To gain our crown as the rightful king of this land of dreams, we must kneel and receive it. To fully realise our escape, we must lay our head down. Then the blade swings, and everything's over. This scene is such a strong one because of how relatable it is. Just as a told story, it has power, but its effect is amplified by how we were made to embody Lewis, to stand at his position, to slice away at the mountains of fish, to feel the monotony of the everyday, and to take joy in the escape that our imagination offered. We directed his steps into a happier world. We bent down our heads to separate the fiction and the reality, the same way we had separated the heads and bodies of so many fish. Going back to my ruminations of control at the start of the video, Lewis's story really shines because of the way in which we had control over his character. We ourselves had our attention split between the fantastical and the mundane, so the break that occurs when the imagined Lewis enters the real world at the cannery, when we lose control of the Lewis in reality and see him as a sad machine carrying on without our input, it's real. We feel it not only through the story being told, but through the way we control that experience. So when anyone asks me what remained with me from What Remains of Edith Finch, I know my answer straight away. It's Lewis.